Welcome everyone to another episode in our Hazards Webinar Wednesday series. We are hosting this series throughout the hurricane season, although the information is relevant to other hazards as well. Previously, we discussed topics relevant to homeowners and business owners, and we covered things like different kinds of insurance, business disruption plans, and resilient building codes. My name is Kate DiGennaro, and I am a planning specialist with Texas Sea Grant, which is part of the Texas A&M University System. I'm located in Brownsville, but I work throughout the Rio Grande Valley and along the southern portion of the Texas coast. My co-host for this webinar is Ashley Bennis, also a Texas Sea Grant planning specialist, and she works mostly in the Coastal Bend region. This series was born out of some conversations about becoming a first-time homeowner, how to determine your hazard risks, and how to find wind and flood insurance. This particular episode will be geared a bit more towards community officials and government staff, but we think homeowners and business owners will be able to learn a little bit more about the post-disaster recovery process as well. The disaster recovery period can be quite overwhelming, and this is probably obvious to anyone who has been through one. If you have not been through a disaster, you might not be able to imagine the many steps and tasks and decisions that have to be made. So we invited some speakers from different agencies to get you thinking about how you can prepare for the recovery period before a disaster even hits your community. As Jim Olk says in his presentation, it's not a matter of if a disaster strikes, but when a disaster strikes. Although we hope it won't happen to our community, it is important to know what to do when it does. Before we get on with our speakers, I just wanna say that this webinar is being recorded and we will send out a YouTube link to all the attendees once we have it ready to go. We will also post the YouTube video on our Facebook page. And now I'll pass this over to my co-host, Ashley Bennis. Thanks, Kate. That was great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I Before we get started, we have uh, great presentations coming up. Uh, we, since we are a state and academic entity, we have to do some poll questions, kind of learning a little bit about our audience. So if you wouldn't mind, we're going to take a couple of minutes. I'm going to put up a poll on the screen, and if you could answer to the best of your ability. We really appreciate it. We're always trying to improve and figure out ways we can engage with the community and bring information and resources. So I'm going to launch the poll right now and it'll be just a couple of minutes. Now, um, I have the poll up and active. Thank you for starting to fill those out. Appreciate it. Perfect. And uh, we certainly know that these webinars have been taking place a lot lately, especially in the time of the pandemic. Um, and uh, we always talk about how there it's never seems to be enough time in the day and things are scheduled at the same time. So if you know someone who wanted to be here or wanted to join, and maybe didn't register, uh, we highly encourage that once we send out that recording, that you share it with anyone you think might be interested, residents, um, as well as city staff, elected officials. There's a lot of information that's gonna come up and it's relevant for a lot of different types of people. Um, so we'll just give it about 30 more seconds then we're gonna launch into our first presentation. Excellent. Thank you everyone for sharing. Um, yes, I think with the recent years, we've, we've seen a lot of disasters across Texas and with the freeze, every, every county was declared. So we're, I'm gonna end the polling now and we are going to start off with um, Jim Oak, who is a building official for the city of Garland and a lead responder with the 
Building Official Association of Texas Disaster Response Team. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Oak. I'm the building official with the city of Garland. I'm also the lead responder for the Building Officials Association of Texas Disaster Response Team. I'm also past president of that organization, as well as the North Texas chapter of ICC and the Region 10 coalition with ICC. I'm currently the vice chair of the Regional Code Coordinating Committee with the North Central Texas Council of Governments, and I'm city of mayor of Lucas. I think some of this is the reason why they asked me to come speak to you today, um, because I've been deployed to over 20 disasters in the last eight years to perform post-disaster damage assessment. And I've also had three disasters here in Garland, uh, one flood and two tornadoes that I've been there from the time of the disaster through all the way through recovery. So I've got some very unique uh, perspective and some experiences uh, that I think they wanted me to share with you. Uh, disasters in Texas are, are not an if, but a when. Um, you know, we've got all these disasters. We generally have some of the highest totals of disaster related damage in the nation every year. Uh, we have more potential for disasters in, in any given season and any given time than the vast majority of other states in the union. So it truly is not a deal of uh, if you're going to have a disaster, but when you'll have a disaster. Uh, I, one thing I really want to stress is disasters start and end locally. Uh, and you'll see what I mean as I go through. What do disasters impact? FEMA has kind of come up with this list of community lifelines and disasters impact all of these lifelines, safety and security, food, water, shelter, health, medical care, energy, communications, transportation, hazardous materials. Building codes and local officials affect every community lifeline. What we do and how we approach it, especially following a disaster, we impact those community lifelines. We can make them recover faster or we can really slow them down. First, we wanna make sure that your community is prepared um, as we talk about damage assessment. We want everybody to review their emergency management plan as it relates to damage assessment, the damage assessment annex. You've got to really look at it. You need to, as I say, flow chart it to see if it will actually work. Go through and step-by-step -step analyze it to see if it's actually going to function and will work at getting damage assessment done expeditiously uh, in your community. Any delay in your damage assessment delays your recovery and it costs money, costs money for your residents, costs money for you as a local government. Um, you, we, we really wanted to clearly define the appropriate individuals to take the steps through this annex. So as you look at that, you wanna make sure that that's covered. Who's gonna do what, when they're gonna do it, what resources are available to, to complete this task. Also be sure that your annex includes any contact in information you need for any mutual aid agreements that you have for the our team, our Building Officials Association of Texas Disaster Response Team, that you've got contact information in your annex so somebody can just pick up the phone and call and go, hey, we need help and, and reach somebody to provide that kind of help. Uh, and the Disaster Response Alliance, which is a, a, a an ICC and the National Structural Engineers Association uh, collaborative list of those folks that can respond on a national level. Um, what you need to have in your city, uh, you know, to be prepared, you need maps of the city available. If you're going to do, if you've got damage, you know, you've got a disaster that's happened, all those people that are responding are going to need maps. Where are they going? What are they going to be looking at? Where are they going to be deployed? Um, you'll also need evaluations, rapid safety evaluation forms, ATC 45. ATC is the Applied Technology Council. ATC 45 is the one for high wind and water damage. They have an ATC 20, which is for earthquake. Out of the 20 disasters I've done in Texas, none of them have been earthquake related. Uh, we don't really use those. We don't have the strong earthquakes like they would in California. 
And ATC 20 was the first one that came up with in California. ATC 45 is kind of a spinoff from that. But uh, the Building Officials Association of Texas has taken that form, revised it, and in, it put a water depth chart, especially for flood damage that it was missing. Um, it's got a better scale for damage uh, percentage, and it's got a part for utility release. Because we're a bunch of, uh, you know, our response team is made up of architects, engineers, and building officials. The primary function are building officials and building inspectors that are municipal government employees that volunteer to come out and do that. We do get the architects and engineers. They'll, uh, uh, we partner with them and they do bring people out to help do those damage assessments, especially when we got the large ones where we need their expertise. But with that, we do have a portion where we do utility releases, which means we can determine, help your local official determine whether or not to turn power or gas or water back on to certain buildings and help them make that determination. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, also, what you need to have on hand are placards, the red unsafe, uh, the restricted use, and the inspected green placards. Here's forms of both. Here's the single sheet rapid uh, damage assessment or rapid safety evaluation form and the placards, the unsafe, restricted use, and inspected. If you need copies of these, please feel free to reach out to me. I can provide you an electronic copy that you can make and then print out. I'll tell you, you know, what kind of paper to buy and all that stuff. It, it, they, they're very handy to have. I've got stacks of them here at my office. Uh, part of that we talked about, you know, uh, initially when you, once you have a disaster or somebody needs to do a windshield survey and determine what the extents of the damage are that they go from point A to point B and point uh, X to point Y so that you know where your damage is, so that you know where people need to deploy and what areas are, are essentially damaged. You'll need to kind of get a gauge on how many buildings that you have that are affected, minor, major, or destroyed. Uh, in, those include residential and non-residential structures and critical structures, your government building, hospital, schools, uh, utility buildings. Uh, those things, you need to know all that, especially from a windshield survey, so then you can go into your rapid safety evaluation, which is truly your damage assessment mode. Folks that do the damage assessment really need to be trained responders. As I said, uh, the architects, engineers, your uh, local inspectors, they all need to have these trainings. The NIMS trainings uh, that are listed here, uh, one or two one or of each of the, any of the disaster response trainings from ICC when disaster strikes or the Cal OES, which is the California Operation, uh, let's see, Office of Emergency Services, uh, SAP training, safety assessment program training. Uh, that teaches them what they're looking for, how to do it, how to fill these forms out, you know, how to do these things in rapid succession. I've seen um, cities that start this don't understand what they're doing um, and get bogged down in it, you know, end up doing code enforcement rather than rapid safety evaluations, which is determining whether or not um, the public safety is being met. That's the ultimate goal of the rapid safety evaluations to begin with is public safety. Are the buildings safe for people to re-enter? Uh, that's why we use the placards, the red, yellow, green placards data collection, which is very important, but it's secondary to the determination whether the building's safe to enter. Now that as you go through recovery, which is kind of what we're supposed to be talking about, that data, having all that data collected on the front end when damage assessment is done is truly important. I can tell you from, you know, going through recovery, oftentimes I refer back to the initial data that was collected and it's a gauge, it also helps to gauge where you've been and where you're going to. How much improvement have you made? How fast are you getting recovery uh, underway? And then what can you do to improve that? So the data collection is, is secondary, but collecting these the bullet points that are on the ATC 45 form will help you in determining where you stand and what that damage total is. Uh, your evaluators don't determine the cost for reconstruction, but you can easily glean that out of when you take the percentage value that comes off of, you know, what the percentage of damage is and what the square footage of the building is, 
and what it generally costs to build, you know, structures within your community. Um, also, determining when utilities can be released. That data that's collected can help your utility providers, your gas, water, uh, and electricity, where to start their efforts first to get the most people back into service the fastest way they can. Getting people back into their homes, back into their businesses, reduce the need for shelter, and get your community back in running uh, order. Uh, in large scale events, you may need to determine if people can shelter in place, if somebody can move back in their house without electricity or without water, because you can supply, you know, water in a in a water truck out in the street, and they can still flush their toilets, they can still do things, you know, that way, or you can provide bottled water for them to drink. So, in the large scale events, trying to reduce those folks, the number of folks in shelters that can actually stay in their homes may be really important. Uh, Critical structures, as I talked about, government buildings, police stations, fire stations, hospitals, those critical structures, they need to be tracked. They need to be, and, and emphasis needs to be putting on when those can be put back into service. So um, you need to track those kind of in a separate form than your other damage assessment. Also those buildings that are important, the grocery stores, the hardware stores, and you know, big box, um, Home Depots, things like that. Those are important because people need to reconstruct their homes. They need those things and to live out there. They need groceries. They need all that kind of stuff. So those buildings need to be uh, tracked separately. Uh, and what buildings need detailed structural evaluations? Did the, the guys go by, looked at the outside, said, yeah, the building looks okay, but man, there's some, uh, there's some racking going on or something that may cause that building to have an issue. So you need to really track those deep, those buildings that need detailed structural evaluations. So in the, in the long run, who answers the questions? Can I go in and get my belongings? Can I stay in my home? Can I start the repairs on my business? What's the minimum I need to do right now? If you have adopted building codes, the building official generally assumes the duties regarding building safety. Uh, and usually is the most qualified person to make these decisions. It's the person that's been trained to understand the structural integrity of the building and what's needed for them, somebody to stay in that building safely. You don't wanna put somebody in a building, you know, that's got a gas leak. You don't wanna put somebody in a building, you know, allow somebody to stay in a building that may be dangerous where something could collapse on top of their heads. Although they may want to, it's not smart move for them to do that. So your local building official is that. The local legislative body, you know, your city council, your county commissioners may want to consider some things. The first that they seem to always want to consider is waiving permit fees. Um, I always suggest that you take time to consider that action. Most disasters, even here when we've been in Garland, um, we have not waived the permit fees because most of that permit fee is covered by insurance. So if 90% of your folks are covered by insurance, you're gonna be able to recoup those expenses that you're expending, you know, putting those buildings back together as part of the city function, issuing the permits, doing the inspections, meeting with those folks out there, letting them know what they need to do, how to get those buildings back, put back together so that people can live in them. Um, it, it, sometimes it's a, a, a PR event you know, to waive the permit fees, but you may be doing more harm than good when you look at long term, especially if you have to go out and hire outside contractors to come in and do that work. Now, uh, FEMA will probably talk to you about some potential grants uh, that are available to kind of recoup some of that money if you end up spending it, but that's if you get a federally clear disaster. If you don't have a federally clear disaster, you really need to think about what that overall impact to your uh, fiscal well-being is, is if you waive permit fees. Always encourage the permitting and inspections. If you aren't doing, there are, I mean, I'm going to jump to this one because it's a little out of order. When you have construction standards, you need to look at those. The building may have been constructed to a different standard. So if you don't require your permits and inspections, you may not be ensuring that that building is being built back correctly. If the lumber spans, I, I mean, this one has changed. 
lumber spans have changed. They don't span as far as they once did. You know, a two by six won't go as far as it once did. So in an older house, they may have had two by six for ceiling joists, holding it up. Now the spans may have changed and two by six may not be strong enough to hold up those loads. So um, requiring building permits and inspections and looking at the standards that you currently have and making sure that those buildings are built to the newer standards. And I'll talk about the zoning issues, but making sure that the buildings structurally are built to the newer standards is really important. It's a safety factor. Those building codes don't change um, for non-safety factors. Uh, the building code is a the, the minimum standard that you can build a building by. It's the worst you can legally build a building. So uh, making sure that your building codes, that you're getting permits and inspections and enforcing your building codes is important. Consider adopting higher standards and uh, consider adopting newer codes. And hopefully you're gonna do this before your disaster hits because you will improve the resiliency as it, whether it's the newer structures that are being built are gonna be more resilient or as people reconstruct those buildings be more resilient to withstand the, the uh, uh, natural forces. Uh, as I talk about non-conforming structures, I'll let me go back, city performed demolitions. Uh, the Consider if you've got a tornado that ripped through your community and a bunch of houses are destroyed, will there be people that walk away from those? And are you as a city gonna be responsible for tearing those buildings down? And that coming out of your budget and your expenses. Uh, so look at that and, and be cognizant of that, that that is an additional expense on top of some of all, all the other things you have to do, you may end up you know, a couple of months down the line going, oh, we have to tear these buildings down because they're just in a state of dilapidation. Uh, Non-conforming structures. As you look and as you've got some damaged buildings, you need to look and see if the structures are conforming or non-conforming to your current zoning regulations. Do they meet the required setbacks, other things that come with zoning, maybe roof pitch, things like that. Will you let them reconstruct back to where it was so I can build that house back on the same slab and maybe it's two feet too close to the side property line? Um, whether or not, you know, they're, you're going to require them to go before your board of adjustment or city council to determine they can reconstruct a non-conforming structure, or if you're going to make them demolish the whole thing and build the whole thing, you know, in conformance with your new code. Most cities, they've got a Kind of a 50 60 percent rule if it's more it's destroyed more than 60 percent it has to be constructed back in conformance with the existing your your newer codes so think about that as you go forward i don't know if it's a right or wrong answer it depends on how fast you want people to get back in their building in the long time uh, you know in the, in the when you look at that big picture um structures with substantial damage located in the floodplain you need generally if you're part of the uh, the flood insurance program, it requires that if you've got a building that's substantially damaged, that that building either be demolished or when it's reconstructed, you, you mitigate those that being in the floodplain. So then you'll either have to elevate it or provide flood vending or other things that can be done to mitigate that flood damage so that the next time the flood happens, you're not in the same place of having to rebuild that building, strip all the sheetrock out and and completely redo it. So, but my point is be sure you've talked about that ahead of time where you're at and what you're gonna do because you may have an entire neighborhood. We had a flood here in Garland, uh, buildings were in the floodplain and some of them were substantially damaged. We had to figure out what to do with those, whether they had to be destroyed or if they needed to, you know, elevate that building, you know, up out of the floodplain. All in all, um, disaster recovery Building codes, zoning codes, and other ordinances along with their enforcement can significantly impact the road to recovery. Continue to think long-term as people start to rebuild. What are the long-term effect of what you're doing and how you're going about that? You know, whether you're loosening or, you know, strengthening your codes and how your enforcement is, where that is. Do I need extra help to come in and help me get through that time, uh, you know, more inspectors, more plans examiners, something to get through that and, and get through that initial influx of all those people coming in wanting to build. I can tell you most people will wanna make improvements to their property uh, 
with disaster reconstruction, you know, uh, they'll, we typically find that they're doing a lot. They're, you know, improving the insides and the outsides of the house when they get the opportunity to, because uh, most of it's paid by, paid for by insurance, or there's just a little bit difference for them to, you know, pay the money and, and make the, their houses much nicer than they were. So think about those things. As people reconstruct, is there a way to encourage them to take those steps to make their structures uh, better and stronger? Uh, and once again, that comes back to, will, it, will your construction techniques make those buildings more resilient to withstand some of those uh, forces of a disaster and keep your residents safe? Uh, and I'll be here to answer any questions. Please feel free to ask me any questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jim. That was uh, very insightful. And I just want to remind everyone that we do have uh, the Q&A chat box. I think I see people are already starting to, to use it. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so if you would, if you are, you know, watching these presentations and you have a question that you want answered, um, please type it in the chat box and we'll either get to it uh, respond to it before um, we're into the Q&A period or we'll wait until the Q&A period to, to get to it. Um, and uh, trying to think if there's anything else. I don't think so. Our, last, our next speaker is uh, Kenneth Bell with the Texas Division of Emergency Management. He is the unit chief in Disaster Recovery Task Force um, involved in that. And he's gonna talk to us a little bit about damage assessment. And yep, let's get it going. We'll give about one more minute and we'll start with the PSTAT exercise. This whole thing will take about 20 minutes uh, to get completed. It's not very uh, comprehensive uh, on the time. Mostly it's the questions at the end that take up a little extra time if you have any. Uh, as we go, uh, you can put in the chat box. I've got uh, Carrie Morgan here, our project specialist, is going to be helping me out with this. And we'll get started here. I did forget to say one thing. That's why it was scrambling. Um, for this particular presentation that Ken um, did a little bit ago, and this was immediately after the freeze event. So a lot of the references he's going to make is to the freeze event. But everything he's talking about and the processes and the, the um, timeline is very relevant for a wide variety of disasters. And we are going to talk a little bit more about that with him in the Q&A. So keep that in mind as you're watching this. All of our technicians are running around doing the other things, so we're kind of uh, one person showing it over here. Uh, my name is Ken Bell. I'm the Infrastructure Unit Chief for the Texas Division of Emergency Management. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is Rapid Damage Assessments, RDA, and Public Assistance State of Texas Assessment Tools. So this is a tool that is authorized for all the local governments, county and city, for your use at no cost to collect damage assessments. The beauty of this tool is not only do you collect them, but you get to watch it live as it goes on and you get to use all the data that you collect. You get to view it, download it on Excel. Uh, you get to look at your own photographs. You get to do whatever it is you need to do. Uh, you will have your own portal access to this product uh, if in use. If you're a subcategory uh, applicant where you might be a smaller agency working through a city or county, you will have, may have to go through that organization uh, the uh, counties all have their own access portal now. Some of the larger cities, and that's up to 30,000 uh, 30, at this point, seem to uh, have access as needed, and we kind of work with people if necessary. Uh, we're going to talk about the sequence of events for this training. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how a, the disaster unfolds. It won't take very long, and where this plays part of that process. We're also going to talk about RDA on both the IA, which is individual assessment, and PA, which is public assistance. 
Uh, there's a lot of acronyms that get thrown around. I will try not to uh, do that, even though it's uh, uh, seems to become a standard operating procedure, but ISTAT, Individual State of Texas Assistance Tool, uh, Assessment Tool, sorry. And we use it for individual assistance is why I fell into that. Same thing for PSTAT, it's Public State of Texas Assessment Tool or Public Assistance. So uh, what we have found is these tools are real quick at turning around our damage assessments and getting us extra categories. And we'll talk a lot about that. Teams, formulation of your damage assessment teams. We're gonna talk about this product, uh, 123 uh, platform and ArcGIS, how FEMA is virtually validating things, and the PA and IA platforms and or the, the, the grant programs at large. In front of you is a QR code for getting back to the uh, performance grant uh, baseline documentation and some other products we have available for you if you want them. I'll show that again at the end. So why PSTAT and why now? Uh, what we have found with the massive impact of this winter storm is we have a 254 county declaration of disaster. This is only the second time in my career of 35 years where that's happened, where every county in the state of Texas was declared. The other time was COVID-19. COVID-19 has also posed another problem for us where the, our FEMA partners are not in a position to come to the field and deploy like they historically have to help with damage assessments. Generally what happens in any case is that a local will have to identify something's broken in the first place before the state and federal partners come out and identify and validate that that damage is actually damage from the event and eligible for the grant program. In this case, we're using virtual validation using your uh, site location GIS, this ArcGIS project product we have for you, uh, photographs, and who you are, what organization or applicant name you might be. So instead of uh, running around in the white van that we used to do back in the day, which wasn't that long ago, uh, we're using this virtual validation. Sequence of events, we've ha already had our disaster, we've already responded. Now we're down to the point where we have to uh, uh, identify or do the rapid damage assessment. Most everybody on this uh, video chat right now have already completed that and already know what your damages are. Uh, and that's a good thing. This product can be done at your desktop. You don't have to use a phone. You don't have to run around town to do it if you have the data already collected. Uh, we'll show you how that works uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, you see the next arrow, the region. That's where our regional partners would come in, our assistant chiefs, district coordinators, and our regional uh, recovery officers will come and help you out if necessary. And we conduct what's called the state PDA. In this case, we're probably going to be doing the same virtual uh, evaluation rather than coming out into the field. There will be opportunities where our personnel will come out and do quality analysis, quality control to uh, uh, what we get reported. So if you report the road at $3 million, somebody's probably gonna come, come take a peek at that uh, versus the smaller projects uh, that get reported up. And finally, the uh, joint PDA along with the federal partners, again, all virtual as much as we can get done to limit the amount of personnel having to go out into the field. So this product and this rapid damage assessment, the entire purpose of what, why we're all sitting in this uh, uh, online chat or this online training is to get more categories. There's a big misnomer out there about what has already occurred. Uh, the president has declared all 254 tech, uh, counties in Texas as category B only uh, emergency response for the grant program under FEMA. The problem with that is most of our damages in actual permanent work were category F or category E. So under category F, all the utilities that were damaged and had to be dug out of the roads and, and repaired, none of that is covered under category B emergency response. Now I'll take that one step further. If you had a underground water main break and the fire department came out and hooked up a fire hose between two hydrants and leveled out your pressure plane or increased one or the other or did something exotic to keep the water running, 
that would be covered under category B. However, the actual fixing of the pipe that was in the ground and designed for that purpose, that's what we call permanent work and that is not covered under the current uh, grant program. That's why we have to prove that we have such damage across the state, and I mean $39 million worth, in order to get the grant program to get you covered for those repairs. In order to do that, we need to get the local jurisdictions to form damage assessment teams, for lack of a better term, uh, just like a battleship. Uh, if you get hit by something or you strike something, you need to know where, where the water's coming in and where it's bad. So you're going to send teams to those locations to find out what's broke, how big is big, how bad is bad. And then you're going to deploy folks to that location and validate that damage with photographs and geolocating yourselves to that spot. Uh, that can include nonprofits, uh, public safety, public works, that's everybody. Anybody that you did business with during the storm uh, would be uh, a potential applicant. What the uh, rapid damage assessment will provide is what it already kind of has provided. So with the I, uh, ISTAT that we pushed out almost day two or day three after the event, we were able to capture over 100 counties into an individual assistance declaration for grant purposes. Uh, we're still searching for those numbers, but we have to move quickly. The problem is at this point, if we don't move uh, by the uh, end of the 30-day uh, cycle, we will no longer be uh, eligible to request uh, that extra category. And that's what we're trying to do is capture these extra categories. You only have about 30 days in most cases uh, to make those declarations. Uh, there are some caveats to that, but it's uh, in our interest to move very quickly on this and get the data up so we can just say, hey, uh, we have a problem. We need this extra uh, grant funding. You have to keep in mind, everything we're dealing with here is an estimate form. Uh, as close as we can get is great, but best guess is okay. Here's some do's and don'ts about uh, rapid damage assessments that we train our people. Uh, our biggest takeaway on this for the local jurisdictions is remembering private property uh, access and taking care of your personnel, making sure they have the right gear uh, before they go down range. That's all this is really re uh, getting into. When we're doing our RDA, or rapid damage assessment, we need to try to quantify what the damage is. And I'm gonna revert back to category F, utilities, where I have a 12 inch water line underground, it's broken, I had to repair it. Uh, depending on the size of the repair, the, how much road I had to tear up to do it, or sidewalk or whatever that case might've been, that could be anywhere from a minor to a major uh, repair or major damage. Uh, the uh, quanti quantifying can be dealt with later. If, if uh, somebody wants to argue it back or forth with engineers, they, they take care of that on the back end. But take your best guess, give it a category and a cost. Pretty straightforward. It gives you two opportunities. You can do it online, like this right here with the browser, or you can download the product and open it on your phone itself. I'm gonna leave the barcode up for just a couple more minutes for any folks that were kind of late and if you wanna participate and, and, and go along with him. Keep going. Pretty straightforward. It gives you two opportunities. You can do it online, like this right here with the browser, or you can download the product and open it on your phone itself. If you have to download the product, which you generally don't need to do, you can open it. But we give you that ability if you're in an area that doesn't have good cell coverage. Once you do get the product open, preferably in your browser, 
It'll use your GIS on your phone. And as you see, just pop down here and it's locating exactly my spot in Austin, Texas right now. It'll even populate my address. But if you have to do this from your desk, for example, you'll have to put in the address and you might have to scooch that little dot around uh, on top to get it to the right place. It's important we geographically locate where the damage is that you're talking about. That's the whole premise of this tool. Then I went ahead and listed my damage type and I'm starting to go through the list of questions. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, the biggest things that we have to get is who you are, where you are, what is broken, and how much you estimate that the cost was to make the repair. And again, we're trying to stick with categories outside of category B. You can do all of your cat B in here if you'd like, uh, but it's uh, um, a, we've already got category B. We're trying to capture as much as we can. Uh, anything you can add to the big number is great. We have to get to $39 million and we've got a long way to go. So the state has to reach a threshold of 39 million. The local jurisdictions have to meet their threshold. And if you geologically locate as necessary, that helps each jurisdiction uh, accordingly or respectively. Here, I'm putting in the actual damages and I have to explain what happened in this case. And I'm doing this off my computer desktop. And what I'm showing you is what you can draw off of a invoice, for example, or a work order ticket. It's uh, damage to an underground line due to freezing. It's a C900 DR14 pipe, got frozen, it's broken, I have to fix it. So there's no emergency work per se in this, even though it was an emergency and everybody else thought it was an emergency, but it's technically permanent work under this grant program. These are the tools I use, the trucks, the people, as much as I can get in there, but what you're about to see is that I, uh, and I intentionally did this so you can see what happens if you put in too much. It'll red out on you. Well, I'll let you go up much further and you have to back out some of the data. As you, the premise of all this is we want a, an overview of what's broken, specific as possible, but if we, uh, uh, the advantage to you is we're trying to go for uh, timeliness in this effort uh, more than detail. We'll always get the detail on the back end because uh, trust me, that'll, you know, how many mega lugs, how many of this, how many of that, that, that seems to go on, on on the back end of the grant if we get to that point. Uh, usually a good work order, a good ticket with a good definition on top of where that it was related to this event, will clear all that up very quickly. We're not trying to recreate work is the bottom line. As you go through, it's going to get to the final, the most, one of the most important uh, points, and that's cost where you have to assess what the cost was for your damage. Uh, most of your people that are professionals in the actual work product, for example, Public Works can tell you it's gonna cost $7,000 to replace that fire hydrant, the T, and all the connections that go along with that. Uh, this pipe broken road, backfill, and it isn't best guess estimate in most cases. Sometimes you know exactly how much it costs depending on how the thickness of the asphalt or concrete. And here, if you look down on this screen, it's literally saying best guess estimate, and that's okay. Finally, we need to get a photograph of the, either the area, the damage, or the damaged equipment. So if, uh, in this case, most of you have already completed this work and there was no photographs taken during that loss. Everybody gets that. But your pipe is still sitting in a yard somewhere. Your road is still damaged and hasn't been overlaid and, and made pretty again. Uh, so that can be photographed. So just something that kind of gives some validation to the fact that there was damage at that location and then a work order ticket and any other subsequent data points, that's pretty much like any uh, product uh, that you have to deal with when you look at what the grant program is designed to do. Uh, there's a lot of uh, conversation about how the FEMA program works. It's not designed to make you whole. It's basically a, uh, a insurance of last resort or a grant of last resort policy. Uh, the way it uh, functions, it's not like an insurance policy, but it's a, it's a grant program of last resort. So if there's other entities out there that can pay under other federal programs, those will be looked at first.
this is what it looks like on your end. Uh, so you as the individual user can go through Web EOC, and I'll show you how to do that here in the next two slides. And this is the product you're going to see. Across the bottom is by category, what you calculated. When you put those costs in there, it's going to break it down by uh, permanent work and emergency work. And it'll actually demonstrates across the map where these damaged areas are. The whole premise is getting other categories added onto the declaration of disaster. With only category B, uh, you can, it might pay for a tree to get pushed out of the road, but it's not going to pay for the tree to be disposed of. Category A will have to be authorized for that to happen. It might pay for you going around with a water key and turning off waters to people's homes, but not repairing the line that fed those homes. Uh, on your side of the meter, of course, or the power substation circuit that was blown out. It might pay for uh, generators that you use to run power, but not the circuit, unless we get category F authorized. In order to get viewpoints to this live uh, damage assessment, you have to go to Web EOC. If you don't have Web EOC, contact your local emergency management official, that be state or city, correction, city or county, and if necessary, you can come all the way up uh, uh, and get access. The state is not in a position to authorize access at the local level without the local authority giving us the permission slip to do that. Once you get into a web EOC, you can go to the common operating picture. Most everybody on these calls the last five days has access. I've only had like one, I think, that didn't, and I think it was a nonprofit. And they're going to be, again, referred back to their local EMC to get that viewpoint if, uh, uh, if they need it. Uh, again, you're going to see this uh, populate here once you go to the common operating picture and you put, push the ArcGIS and this is what you're going to see. Once you hover over the, the, the little dots here, you can push on that dot. It'll tell you where, who, when, and the photograph will actually populate on the bottom. So all your data is here. And you can download it in an Excel format and uh, look at it later and manipulate that Excel however you want for whatever your purposes are. The bottom line is, this is your information you're sharing with the state that we can share with our federal partners. The beauty of this project is when three weeks from now, when, when people are having a conversation about what's going on here or over here, we're all looking at the same map at the same project without having to email, phone, do all this other technology. It's all sitting in front of everybody at the same time. Here are the different categories that I keep uh, calling out. We talked about category A for debris, uh, category F, and then E for buildings and such. So under category E, that's gonna be a huge claim due to all the busted water pipes and damages inside. Again, FEMA grant uh, programs uh, for disaster are the grant of last resort. So if you have insurance, it won't pay what insurance pays, but it can take care of the deductible, for example. Or if, you're, if your insurance taps out, it might be able to pick up the difference on the other end. Every case is different and it's hard to quantify and or qualify in this, this uh, presentation, uh, but there's always an advantage uh, to uh, Put the data in so we can get those thresholds, so we can even get to category E to have the conversation. Using this product and this platform, uh, by the way, we've used it for about five years at a regional level during hurricanes and such, and it's worked out really well. So we, we know the platform works, we've tested it, uh, but this is what you're calculating is the top three uh, elements of the nine points that we have to get to uh, to uh, get you a fully successful grant funded uh, operation going on. Uh, the uh, one, two, and three is where we're who, what, where, when, and how much, and then validations of that. So scope of work and all these other costs and these estimates, that comes after your uh, application as, an, as a participant or an applicant. And uh, that you'll be uh, held, uh, helped through that process as uh, that unfolds. Right now, we can't even get to most of that process unless 
uh, we get these uh, numbers in for these other categories. If you're going for category B, you do need to go to an applicant briefing, and I believe they're every morning at nine o'clock during the week, during regular work days, um, for the, until the foreseeable future. This training will go on every day, including the weekends, uh, so we can make sure we can get as many people out doing damage assessments as possible. This is a, another back end of what documentation is gonna be necessary in these projects. Uh, not today, obviously, not next week, but if we get the category authorized and they say, okay, we're successful in category F, they're gonna to wanna to see these photos, which you already have. They're gonna to wanna to know where, what you already done, those top three items. And then they're gonna to wanna to look at the uh, uh, work orders and such, but that's on the back end. And uh, typically you've had time at that point to figure out how much it really costs. So if it actually costs a little bit more or a lot more to fix than what you thought, that's fine. If it costs less, that's fine too. It will be deducted out of the, uh, off of what you thought, what you originally estimated, but that's understood. Again, uh, uh, grant program of last resort, they're gonna look at every other uh, avenue before they put their uh, program dollars into it. So we're not running around, we don't, we, and I used to be a local, sorry. Uh, we don't go and do state highways, for example. That's not my jurisdiction. If I'm a county or, or a, a city official, that's state highway. So they have funding for that and TxDOT takes care of that. If you have a dam in your area, I had seven that surrounded mine. The only reason I had interest in that at that time was that I had a contract to maintain them. So they became mine to a degree uh, but generally there's funding for NRCS or uh, Corps of Engineers. So that made it a little bit more difficult, and, but I still collected damages on those, reported them up, and then it gave me a, an opportunity to use other pathways to get funding for it. Uh, generally speaking, FEMA will not uh, get involved with core projects. They can, there's caveats to all of this, uh, or NRCS projects, uh, but you need to know what's broke and how bad it is. And that's the whole premise of DSOs, and uh, PSTAT and why we're trying to achieve all this. So a lot of counties, and I'm going kind of quick on this, but these are just kind of side conversations here. A lot of counties got uh, individual assistance in this operation. The advantage of that, especially in the West where they don't get a lot of declarations over the years, is that every county that was touching uh, the IA County now has an opportunity to be included in the SBA uh, program where they can uh, get SBA loans for business interruption or whatever the case might be. It's a great program. The IA has access to SBA, uh, but the counties adjoining may only have access to just the SBA or Small Business Administration. Sorry about that. RDA considerations, rapid damage assessments. Remember the cost any insurance that's out there, we're going to have that. Uh, it's a, it pops down and it asks you that question if you get into the right category, the right blank, and then what type of impacts. So we have two different forms of information that's coming into TDEM right now. We have a DSO, the damage summary outline, which is on our main webpage, and how you access it is uh, through your, you can ask for your DC for the code if you're authorized and that's city and county level. We have the PSTAT. The PSTAT is basically the same effort, however it quantifies the DSO, breaks it down into categories and gives it a numeric, much more specific than the, the 30,000 foot view. The DSO's, uh, uh, the objective of the DSO is for us to know how big and bad it is in the first 48 hours so we could say, we need help. A PSTAT can be used at any time along with the DSO. What that does is it turns the category around almost instantaneously. In three days, we had over 100 counties with IA because of ISTAT, because we had a photo, a location, and broke. That's all they needed to see. With a damage summary outline where it gets us to get more mobilized equipment, we, we get a comment on there that says $3 million for a road. We have to validate that. Well, you can validate that with PSTAT immediately. Show us $3 million worth of damage, then nobody has to drive out there and spend another week 
waiting for that category to be authorized. Hopefully that makes sense. The only reason we rolled that out in this event is based on the size of this event. This is massive. It's across all borders of our, our state. Uh, so it's kind of an unheard of deal. Um, they're, we're not trying to push out new things, but this was a fast thing that can get the answers that we need for you and your jurisdictions to get these grant funds. Right. Let me stop sharing. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, Ken, that was really informative. Um, and um, in the Q&A portion, hopefully we have some time to get to it, but I know that some of the issues and um, resources post the winter storm is still ongoing. So maybe we'll get Jim, uh, Ken to talk about that a little bit. Um, our next person, and again, Q&A, box is blowing up a little bit and thank you so much Rebecca for kind of getting that going um, feel free to answer any uh, answer ask any questions at any point but we're going to move along to our next speaker which is Brian Bartley with the uh, FEMA region 6 he is the hazard mitigation emergency management specialist with the mitigation and floodplain management and insurance branch he's got some information about uh, floodplain management post-disaster and, and some consideration communities can make in that regards. It's hard to talk and do things at the same time. I'm working on it. Okay. Brian Barkley. I'm with FEMA Region 6 in Houston, Texas. And my job there is to um, work with community officials on um, implementing their flood damage prevention ordinance or order, depending on whether they're a city or a counts, uh, county. And um, in many cases, that's also um, part of their uh, codes and standards for the community. And in our last session, uh, working with uh, Gilbert Giron, our uh, regional flood insurance liaison, we uh, discussed some questions and answers related to the National Flood Insurance Program and building codes. And one of those was, uh, what is the, the difference between a uh, regulation and a code? And I thought after our last session, it'd be appropriate to do a bit closer examination of how FEMA and the National Flood Insurance Program are utilizing building codes and expanding a bit more on the differences uh, between uh, National Flood Insurance Program minimum regulatory standards or regulations and building codes. So let's get right to it. The National Flood Insurance Program technical bulletins have been around for a long time. Traditionally, They've been used by local officials of NFIP participating communities to ensure that the construction methods and practices used would result in a structure that complies with program minimum standards established by the NFIP regulations. More recently, and in keeping with FEMA's initiative to encourage the adoption and use of building codes for resiliency and development, the NFIP is incorporating information and references from the most recent consensus codes and standards, keeping the bulletins current and aligned with the latest concepts and advances in building sciences. There's also a fact sheet uh, found at the FEMA Building Services Branch SharePoint site that gives specifics on how several of the NFIP technical bulletins were updated on March of 2020 to reflect the changes needed to modernize and streamline their content and presentation. According to this fact sheet, the technical bulletins received updates. The updated technical bulletins will be uh, will incorporate relevant information from the latest international codes and American Society of Civil Engineers standards, provide updated guidance and best practices observed from post-disaster assessments, and uh, 
update known issues based on input from a wide range of stakeholders. These changes are intended to improve the technical bulletin's usability, credibility, and content while presenting them in a streamlined format. There's a link to this resource at the end of the presentation, and I highly recommend looking at the destination document. Uh, this document, Reducing Flood Losses Through the International Codes, is uh, published periodically by FEMA, uh, the latest update being the fifth edition, October 2019. The uh, International Codes, a family of codes developed and maintained by the International Code Council, shares common goals with the Federal Emergency Management Agency. FEMA, National Flood Insurance Program, FIP, protection of public safety and reduced property damage. There's a map on page 1-11 that shows how well the adoption of flood risk resilient codes is doing nationally. It is, the res uh, it is getting better with time. There is an outline of the results of the study done after the passage of Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act 2012, where a law that was not well, that popular in many respects um, included something that was actually uh, worked out positive. The action of implementing codes to the NFIP if un a study uh, was undertaken. Um, and the results of that study showed that if the NFIP undertook to integrate with codes, the overall um, undertaking would be a positive thing. This publication does a pretty good job of providing a crosswalk outline between the codes and the NFIP regulations. Chapter three is specifically on the topic of the differences between the NFIP regulations and the ICC code. Uh, I think over time, the two things, um, regulations and uh, building codes, uh, will trend towards congruency and an eventual merger. The next three resources that I'd like to point out to you today are uh, the 2018 quick ref reference. I find this reference to be very useful as providing a concise walkthrough of the regulations applied by zone as depicted on the effective FEMA issued flood insurance rate map. This is the regulatory map for floodplain management purposes for a community. For each zone, this quick reference resource shows how the consensus codes apply. FEMA has determined that the flood provisions in the 2018 edition of the International Codes meet or exceed the minimum NFIP requirements found at 44 CFR 60.3, the regulations. In some respects, the IRC and IBC and the ASCE, ASCE 24 expand on requirements of the NFIP regulations with more specificity, additional requirements, and some limitations not found in FIP regulations. This quick reference guide includes illustrations with references. Uh, the middle is a checklist for the 2015 I-codes and FIP regulations to, to give you a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, this job aid provides a fact sheet with some useful links to associated resources explaining the application of codes and the attached checklist by means of a visual on uh, page one. It gives a flow chart of how a building official or other public official responsible for floodplain development would develop flood resistant code provisions administratively to arrive at a locally developed standards based on the consensus codes as the foundation. The checklist provides a side by side applicability of the ICC and IRC, uh, uh, excuse me, the ICC, IRC and IBC with AC, ASCE 24 as meeting specific provisions. Uh, that's the uh, Inter International Residential Code and International Building Code, IRC and IBC. Um, as meeting specific provisions of the 44 CFR 60.3 requirements. Uh, on the right, uh, FEMA uses ASCE 24 for our mitigation projects, incorporating any higher standards from your community. 
the provisions of ASCE 24 are consistent with NFIP performance requirements and are intended to meet or exceed NFIP regulations. Building stronger in a post disaster environment. Uh, flood events, as unfortunate and painful as they are for communities, uh, are an opportunity. The opportunity is that a flood provides experience and data that can be used for purposes of developing responsibly and providing for community resiliency into the future. Communities can use this experience to develop local methods and practices as well as resiliency standards. Some data may be perishable though, so having a game plan will be essential. I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit uh, later. Uh, use of high watermark data to better understand the effects of actual flooding based on real conditions. This will also serve to inform the cumulative effects of development. Ex expanding regulatory floodplain uh, following the data may result in the identified need to expand it, um, or conversely, it may show the positive effects of mitigation practices. So you may find out that the the uh, special flood hazard area is actually uh, receding, not expanding, depending on what you're doing as a community. And then uh, requiring freeboard, uh, require freeboard over and above minimum NFIP standards and IRC standards. Uh, freeboard is the best defense against the future conditions that we know will exist. Uh, if the population continues to trend toward increase and development continues in order uh, to house humanity. It is also the best practice to account for expected climate change trends and elevation is the salvation of inundation. There's no better way to prevent uh, flood damage to a structure. Now here's a couple of examples where communities have used this approach and developed um, uh, ways to locally implement codes and standards that they found applicable to their community. The city of Houston, after the devastating effects of Hurricane Harvey in 2017, tax flood, tax day flood in 2016, and Memorial Day flood in 2015, um, the city's uh, floodplain ordinance was updated to make sure this the city had more was more resilient as it rebuilt. City data found that 33% of all homes in the 500 year floodplain flooded during Harvey and an even higher percentage, 38% of all, all the currently compliant homes in the 100 year floodplain flooded. So they asked what was happening. Uh, quoted from the report, data drawn from, among other sources, the Greater Houston Builders Association, the Houston Housing and Community Development Department, the National Flood Insurance Program and FEMA estimate that the cost of newly constructed homes of complying with their new requirements would range from $11,000 to $32,000, uh, while savings from avoided flooding costs would range uh, from $50,000 to many hundreds of thousands of dollars. The benefits uh, from avoided risk to first responders, emotional trauma, health impacts, economic impacts, and many other consequences of flooding were not quantified in this study, but they are assumed to be significant, and I'm sure many of us understand that. Uh, Horry County, South Carolina, after devastating flooding from 2018's Hurricane Florence, citizens pushed the county council uh, to pass higher freeport requirements and safeguard critical facilities uh, by not building new ones in the 100 year and 500 year floodplains or 1% and 0.2% chance floodplains respectively. These are examples of how a community using the known effects of flooding from actual flooding events to develop local standards for risk reduction and in both cases, not just work within the FEMA identified regulatory floodplain or special flood hazard areas. Uh, yes, ultimately, a community is best equipped by virtue to proximity to the event and recovery to develop the higher standards based on the foundations or reg regulations, codes and standards 
and risk identification sciences. And then finally, uh, we have some recovery advisories, which are um, their information products developed by FEMA uh, after um, you, you know using the same approach with uh, data gathered after an event. Uh, FEMA does put out these uh, recovery advisories after large scale federal disaster events. It, this is a best practices and lessons learned approach to using the opportunity presented by a major damage event. We see here that FEMA's hazard performance analysis teams gather data after an event and apply it to the questions of how to build better and stronger to avoid damage to property and loss of life. Uh, states and communities can take the concepts communicated through the already existing codes and standards and apply them in a similar way when merited informed by observations of the risks faced locally. FEMA mitigation assessment team program and reports are uh, similar to what I just talked about. Um, the MAP program allows FEMA to assemble and quickly deploy teams of investigators. After 2017's Hurricane Harvey, the MAP was deployed to Harris County to assess flood performance issues and to Aransas, Nuestas, Refugio, and San Patricio counties to assess wind performance issues. These are excellent resources. However, they may take time to study and publish. For example, the Harvey Matt report was published roughly two years after the event. We all know rebuilding can begin to take place within days or weeks after a disaster, so it would be better to have the information sooner. It's smart to use uh, similar events across the country uh, as lessons learned for your community. So finding one of these kind of uh, resources that's similar to what happened where you are uh, would be useful. It's also wise to apply any available local knowledge of effects of natural or man-made hazards before an event takes place and apply them to community planning measures and hazard risk reduction plans and initiatives. I recently did a search on YouTube with two words or one acronym and one phrase. Uh, they were FEMA, the acronym, and building code, the phrase. That search returned a wealth of videos on how FEMA and state partners are seeking to apply pre-disaster planning principles in the form of projects and administrative capacity acquisition as related to codes and standards. But uh, there were some very good ideas presented in what I did watch. And that brings me to a uh, post-disaster uh, immediate aftermath topic that's um, oftentimes a difficult one. Substantial damage uh, and reimbursement and mitigation funding. Uh, communities should plan now for post-disaster response, including having a substantial damage plan. How, how are you going to do your substantial damage determinations and administer the permitting requirements of that? And the uh, the code enforcement. Um, Disaster Recovery Reform Act, DARA of 2018, Section 1206, may be able to provide FEMA public assistance reimbursement to your community for administering and enforcing uh, your building code and floodplain management ordinances. Now, what's different about this from thing from times past is um, in times past, the funding for this type of activity was not already predetermined how it would be accessed and what would be required. In this case, with this uh, Reform Act, it is. And so there's a resource at the on the last uh, part of this presentation, which I would encourage you to avail yourself of the information and understand how in your community you're going to implement processes to best uh, position your community to take advantage of this funding resource. Um, FEMA hazard mitigation assistance grants may be available for mitigating structures that were substantially damaged. For more information in Texas, uh, see the flood information clearinghouse at uh, that uh, URL that's showing in the blueprint. So 
So here's some of the resources I've talked about. Uh, the NFIP technical bulletins, reducing flood losses through the international codes, uh, user guide to technical bulletins, the quick reference guide I talked about, and, and some others. Um, there's also uh, these resources, which include the, the one, the main one I want to point out to you here is uh, the DRRA section 1206 FEMA public assistance reimbursement for building code and floodplain management administration enforcement. It's a very important piece of your post disaster picture uh, going into the future. And then finally, uh, if you have any questions about any of these resources or would like to discuss them, uh, here's my contact information, or if you uh, you know need other uh, resources available within FEMA that I might be able to direct you to, please feel to re feel free to reach out. Excellent, thank you, Brian. Really appreciate that. And um, on the previous webinar, we had part one for. Uh, the Building Stronger, we talked a lot about resources before, uh, resources and steps to take before disaster that communities can help their constituents and the residents prepare and um, really take those steps uh, to make sure that the recovery process is a lot shorter. So we had some information from the ICC and some information from GLO actually about funding programs. So we will be sharing that link shortly in the chat box uh, so that you can have access to it, but got a great wealth of information. And now I'm going to transition over to our last presentation before the Q&A. Um, so our next presentation comes from Julie Shio Woodard, uh, President and Chief Executive, Executive Office for Smart Home America, and Alex Carey, who is Fortified Market Development Manager at Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. My name is Alex Carey, and I am the Market Development Manager for the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, or IBHS. And I'll be presenting today in coordination with Julie Shai Woodard from the President and CEO of Smart Home America, who will be presenting after me. Today, I'm gonna talk about the Fortified program. Um, we do have a Fortified commercial program, but today I'm gonna be covering Fortified Home, which is appropriate for residential um, single family construction and um, the multifamily is all under fortified commercial. So I'm gonna dive right in and first tell you about the Insur Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. Um, we are a research organization and we conduct research on um, wind, on hail and rain and wildfire at this research center, which is located in Richburg, South Carolina. We are 100% funded by the property insurance industry to make homes and businesses safer and to make communities more resilient. We're able to, in this research center, um, apply all of these hazards to full-scale structures, both residential and commercial. And through our research here and our research out in the field, we are able to come up with very tried and true methods to make homes and businesses more resilient to natural disasters and all of those hazards that I mentioned. Um, where the rubber meets the road and where these real world results are realized is in our fortified program. We know with great surety that after any given event, we see this type of progression of damage based on the wind speeds. So when a wind event, whether it be a hurricane or whether it be a straight line wind or a severe convective storm in the more inland areas of our country, um, we know that roof cover is always the first thing that is lost, um, soffits and fascia as well. Um, the roof is the first line of defense of any structures uh, against, against mother nature. And it is most often the very first thing that gets damaged, even in low level wind events. From there, we often see wall cover or siding and then roof sheathing. In the very higher winds, we start to see the actual entire roof structure be damaged. And then 
when the wind speeds reach, reach their highest peaks, we end up seeing in many cases total collapse of the structure um, if measures are not taken to make those, those structures stronger. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about how we can reduce that damage um, even at the, the higher wind speed events. And then if you do have damage, even in lower events, um, how you can rebuild or re-roof to prevent that damage from happening or reduce that damage in the future. So the Fortified program is a voluntary program and contractors and builders can use the standards and offer the, their home buyers or offer their home owners in the case of re-roofing a um, third party validated um, protection against all of those severe weather events that I, that I mentioned earlier. And these, these um, standards go a little bit above and beyond the standard building code. We do know that building codes work, but um, they don't always address things like the specific details of the roof that keep the roof intact and keep the water from coming in the home. Talk a little bit more about that in a moment. It is geographically appropriate. So we have standards for high wind in the inland areas and hurricane in the coastal areas. And for each of those standards, there are three levels of durability starting with the roof, as I mentioned, and then moving into the silver and gold levels, which I'll explain in just a little bit. Each of these levels builds off the other. So you cannot get to the silver and gold levels unless you've achieved fortified roof first. And in gold, we wanna make sure that you have both the roof and the silver levels met. So nationally, we have almost 30,000 homeowners that have designations on their homes and are better protected from severe weather events. The types of structures I mentioned, single family for fortified home. Um, we also do things like duplexes and triplexes, townhomes, and even manufactured homes if they are on a, a permanent anchoring of some sort. Um, so those are those all fall under under residential. Multifamily or things like um, businesses would all fall under the commercial program. The fortified standard I mentioned that hurricane would go right around that area where you see that blue line. Those are where the wind speeds tend to be tend to fall under the hurricane standard in every other part of the country we would apply the high wind standard. The hail is actually a supplement that can be applied to either hurricane or high wind and that can be utilized in any part of the country and would be an add on um, which specifically would be related to using an impact rated shingle or impact rated roof cover. So to, to simplify it and, and um, make it more e easy to understand, there are three perils, hurricane, high wind, and hail that are addressed by Fortified, three levels, roof, silver, and gold, and then three steps to the program, which is confirming the eligibility and the level that, would, that you're, you're going for. You actually would apply the standards by building or re-roofing, and then you would get verified at the end. For the inland areas, I'm gonna talk a bit more about hurricane, um, but in the inland areas, we know that those high level tornadoes, the, the EF fours and fives, that it is, it, we, we do not have a design to prevent the damage that occurs there. Um, so we cannot prevent that damage, but we know that we can drastically reduce the damage that occurs in the periphery of those storms. And you can see here, um, that path of damage from the, the high level tornado is very evident in the middle. But all of that damage you see in the periphery where those roofs are damaged, we know that we can prevent that type of damage. I do wanna mention that with Fortified, we're not talking about keeping um, damage from occurring at all, but we are reducing, drastically reducing damage so that you're more quickly able to um, rebuild or re-enter that structure, um, repair that structure and move back in more quickly or without any disruption at all. We did do a, a, um, a water intrusion test in our research facility where we applied high winds that blew the roof off. On one side, we had what we call a sealed roof deck, which is the seams um, of the roof decking were, were sealed up with tape. Um, the other side, we did not have those seams sealed. The unsealed side had nearly $17,000 worth of damage when we did a damage estimate after the test. The side with the um, sealed roof deck was only about $5,500, which was essentially the cost to put that roof back on. The side without the sealed roof deck had damage, lots of damage inside where the water poured in. 
and you'll see um, this was this what what was happening underneath that roof. You'll see that the insulation and the drywall were saturated. You see that wet couch. Everything came pouring in, um, and that's that home and that family is going to be displaced for some time while they do the repairs. The other side with the sealed roof deck um, was completely dry and more importantly livable. Um, so this is the type of damage that we're talking about. Little things can make a very significant difference. Things like ring shank nails can double the strength of your roof. You see there on the left. The seam tape can prevent the type of damage that I just showed to you in, in a, a vast amount of cost, um, as well as the cost of displacement. And then we also know that in the, in the higher levels where we can put those hurricane straps in, um, that also can make a very significant difference. Hi, I'm Danny Lipford with Today's Homeowner. As a contractor for more than 40 years, I've seen building science improve the way we build houses. Research from groups like Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety helps us beyond building codes to get even stronger homes. When I built my home, I followed the fortified construction standards because they're based on decades of science and they make it easy to know which upgrades provide the level of protection against severe weather I want. There are three levels of fortified and all of them start at the roof, your home's first line of defense against severe weather. Strong winds can grab a hold of that first row of shingles and tear them off in bunches. A fortified roof locks down the edges with a tougher drip edge and a row of shingles called a starter strip that is glued to the roof. But you can still lose a few shingles which would allow water to easily leak through the gaps of the roof deck and into your home. So fortified requires roofers to seal those seams, stopping as much as 95% of the water from getting in, even if you lose a few shingles. Fortified Roof even pays attention to small details like nails. By adding more of them in a specific pattern and using a ring shank nail, instead of a smooth one, you can double the strength of the roof deck against the wind. You can also take Fortified one step further and use shingles tested by IBHS to stand up to hail up to two inches in diameter. The Fortified program verifies these improvements using an independent third party called an evaluator. They document all of the key upgrades and verify that fortification procedures have been used on the project so they can provide the report to IBHS to review it and issue a designation. To get started with Fortified, you can either contact an evaluator or you can use the Fortified directory to find a contractor trained to install a Fortified roof. It doesn't matter if your roof is covered with shingles, tiles, or metal, Fortified can help you get better protection from severe weather. And it really is as easy as a phone call. Okay, so Danny did a great job at covering the fortified roof level. I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit more about the silver and gold levels. Um, fortified silver is doing what we call reducing damage amplifiers, meaning that it's protecting systems that if they are damaged can create a lot more damage to the home. Things like strengthening gable walls and porches, as well as strengthening openings. Openings we know can create significant damage if they are breached by letting the wind pressure come into your home, which can cause in some cases catastrophic damage. So things like, um, this is specifically for hurricane areas, you would wanna either have impact rated windows if you are replacing your windows, um, and if you have any garage door damage, replacing your garage door, which is a very significant opening, is a, is a really easy way to protect, further protect your home um, from damage in the future. So getting a design pressure rated door and then either getting that, like I mentioned, the, the impact rated windows and doors or protecting them with some sort of shutter, um, shutter system, hurricane shutter system. For by gold level, um, incorporates the roof, keeping the roof on and the water out. It reduces those damage amplifiers in silver and then keeps the entire building intact with what we call a continuous load path, which is protecting um, and protects the, the openings against high pressures. The continuous load path keeps the entire structure intact. So it's tying the roof to the walls and the walls to the foundation. This would most, most likely be applied, um, most often applied when you are building new because all of those things are happening behind the walls with the actual framing of your structure. So if you're building new after a storm, that would be where you would apply this. But the other levels are more appropriate if you have an existing home um, and easier to apply to, to an existing home. 
for the high wind areas of the country um, where we would apply this standard, very similar things related to the roof. The fortified roof is, is just about um, the same as it is in the hurricane areas where we wanna keep that roof on and water out. Silver, also very similar systems that we're addressing, things like gable ends and overhangs. Here, we're also addressing the chimneys and keeping the chimney attached to the structure, um, as well as porches and carports. In fortified gold, same, we're looking at continuous load path, and we're, this is where the garage door would fall into place for the high wind areas of the country. Um, so again, we're keeping that load path, that roof to the walls, the walls to the foundation, as well as um, getting a high wind rated garage door. The hail supplement can again be applied to either of those um, and would um, be an impact rated roof cover. And for shingles, they must meet the good or excellent rating. Um, and we actually have that on our, on our website as far as which shingles actually um, met our testing standards. As far as getting a designation, um, especially a fortified roof if you're re-roofing, um, you would actually select a roofer. Start by picking a fortified roofer. We have roofers that are that are trained in um, across the country. Um, if you have a roofer that is not trained and is not familiar with the fortified program, we actually do have a very quick and easy training on our on our website for them to better understand the standards. Um, they would actually apply the standards when they're re-roofing. Um, they'd strip your roof off. What a, if you had damage to your roof, they'd strip the remaining roof off and then they would start by re-nailing the deck, sealing the seams, and then applying the fortified roof, the high wind rated roof cover. From there, the evaluator would actually work very closely with that roofing contractor and document throughout the entire process. They'd be taking photographs of each level as the roofer installed or collecting photographs from that roofer. So that's a really important um, relationship is making sure that the contractor and the evaluator um, are, are working together. And then at the end, you would get your for, uh, IBHS reviews all of the different in documentation and then they would get a certificate. You would get a certificate at the end that says your, your roof is fortified. This would be specific to your home and would have your address on it. It would be, um, it is transferable. So if you were to sell your home, you would actually um, be able to transfer this to the new owners. It is valid for five years. And after that five year period, we would have a evaluator come back out and re-inspect to make sure that your roof is still in good condition and that that designation um, would be able to continue. Who can do the work? Um, we do have on our, website of contractors, builders, roofers um, that have been trained. And we also have our fortified evaluators that are on our listing as well. And those can be found at fortifiedhome.org and Smart Home America, who you're about to hear from, also has our listing on their website. Um, so I am going to pass it along to Julie now, I'm the CEO of Smart Home. And thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Alex. As Alex said earlier in the presentation, I am Julie Shayu Woodard with Smart Home America. We're a nonprofit located in Mobile, Alabama, and we serve the United States. We work wherever our funders and partners ask us to support. And our biggest job is to take the science that IBHS creates and other entities and get it integrated into that local community so that resilience is happening every single day. A lot of what we do is educate on how building codes work and building codes should be used. And then what are the techniques of fortified that are different from building codes or a little bit beyond building codes and why that makes a huge difference pre and post disaster. So today we're talking about post disaster, right? Storms already come through, it's hit, damage is done. We know since 2017 in ground truthing, everything that's been going on after tornadoes and hurricanes that building codes just straight up work. And the more current they are, and if they're really enforced, they really hold those buildings and structures together. But what we consistently see, and what Alex said earlier, is that the main damage that we see is that water intrusion through the roof. The roof is just the most important first line of defense for a structure. And once you lose that covering and the water, the water pours in, that's where the homeowners displace. That's where your debris removal goes up. That's where everybody loses time recovering. 
So what we know Fortify does is it really changes the paradigm that we've lived through for what, I mean, hundreds of years, right? Storm hits, come back in, build everything back the same way. Storm hits, goes down, build back everything every same the same way. So Fortify is a little different in that no matter where Fortify is done across the United States, it's the same standard, implemented the same way, meets the same level of protection for that property. So it's pretty significant in that. So everybody can rely that it's being done that way and that it's going to work. So post-disaster, we were... Um, in Hurricane Sally in 2020, Alabama has the greatest number of designated structures. We have lots of structures built to and re-roofed to fortified. We have right at about 24,000 that are actually designated. And so the significance there is that they went through the first significant test. Hurricane Sally was a cat two storm. It moved at a two to four mile an hour um, pace, which is why we saw so much damage because of the slow moving and the intensity of the homes that sat in the eye wall for eight to nine hours just took a greater beating than they normally would with, a, with that normal pace of a hurricane where it just moves pre pretty quickly. Um, so we saw a lot of damage that we wouldn't normally have seen um, technically if, if even a greater storm had come through, but moved through quickly. We had about 17,000 structures designated in our area that went through the, um, the storm. And right now to date, it looks like the data is gonna show that about 95% of those structures had no claim. So it's no insurance claim. So that means that family wasn't displaced unless they couldn't handle not having power and, and no air condition. They didn't have water intrusion into the home. For the 5% that saw damage, the data is showing right now that it's that ancillary damage, like the garage or a tree or a car, but not water intrusion into the living space. In Hurricane Michael, we saw very similar things. That was a Cap 5 hurricane, and I want you to draw your attention to those five um, objects in the middle of the screen. Those are Habitat for Humanity homes. Those were built to the fortified standard, went through a Cat 5 storm, and only one of them took one little bit of damage where a piece of siding was loose, not gone. Those homeowners could come back and start recovering very quickly. And they are our important population. Those are our vulnerable. Those are our workforce. In Hurricane Sally, we saw very typical, um, if, the, if it was built to a higher level code and it was built strong, we were seeing the damage in the roof and the gable ends, which is that weak part. All of this is preventable with Fortified, all of this. If you wanna actually hear the testimonies of some of the homeowners that we um, have in our area, you can go to our website. Um, this homeowner had no damage to his home. All of his neighbors had water intrusion. He met his neighbors for the first time by walking door to door to see how he could help them. Um, this homeowner was able to rest assured that she could sleep through the storm because everything was working well for her and her shingles stayed on. Lots of shingles in her yard in this um, video. So it's very interesting to see the difference. We had commercial properties that did extremely well in this storm. And for all of you that work in municipalities, the big thing after a storm, if you didn't have the codes in place beforehand, get them in place. If you don't have a plan in place for a stronger building back, look to the feds to help fund that through BRIC and what will soon be the Storm Act. FEMA, USDA, and SBA um, and HUD all recognize Fortified. It is not called that, it's called FEMA's P804 in their construction manual. It is recognized and the feds will let you use that money to pay for that reconstruction. Texas has been doing that since Harvey hit. Um, SBA will increase funding for a single family residential and a small business up 20% if that owner decides to go fortified. That's pretty significant. There is a job aid to help you understand the P804 and that construction. If you work for a municipality and one of your nightmares is debris removal, and if you lived in the coastal bend after Harvey, you live that nightmare. If you get the structures in your community to a fortified level, you're going to reduce that debris removal cost pretty significantly. So if you can remove that average $7,200 per single family, 2,000 square foot, just take how many are in your, in your neighborhood, in your city, in your community, multiply that 7,200 and you have a potential um, savings there. We also know that homes appraise better when they are fortified. The latest big thing in Texas is that the Roofing Contractors Association of Texas, and I'm going to come back to this um, fraud in a second, they're now licensing their roofers. That's significant. If the roof is the first line of defense and anybody in Texas can roof your house, I mean, I could fly in and roof your house. 
then finding a loss, licensed contract roofer is huge because it is a skilled trade and they hold the insurance that protects them and the homeowner. We have a website for you to go to to find all of this stuff. Um, so those are those websites. Alex shared them with you in the beginning. But let's go back to this one, especially if you work for a municipality. If you're a homeowner, it's important and you can get this. But if you work for a municipality or a county, fraud is rampant after disasters. You've all lived this if you've lived through a disaster. And roofing fraud is so very large and present. And that means that that first line of defense isn't necessarily getting put back on correctly. So we have a checklist that we encourage homeowners to use when they are going to quote and get people to work on their roof. Because if that roof's not put back on correctly, it's not going to get through even a tropical storm in many instances. So roofing fraud is really important, especially when they want the homeowner to sign over the insurance benefits to them and they'll handle everything for the homeowner. That's actually illegal. And, and homeowners don't understand this and they don't know it. So I know it was really fast, but I'm trying to keep to time. So again, everything I just shared with you is at our website, smarthomeamerica.org and at the Don't Goof sites. And we'll be here, at, um, Alex and I will answer questions during the answering um, section. So thank you very, very much. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Alex and Julie. That was great and a little bit different than what you guys presented last time, which was interesting. Um, I am going to put into the chat right now a link to the part one of our webinar, Building Stronger in regards to before a disaster, what communities can do beforehand. And like I said, um, there's some great information about the ICC. Um, Smart Home America was able to share some of the videos of the research that's done in their state-of-the-art facility showing you just how these buildings fail, where those um, fail points are. And then um, the GLO has some funding opportunities coming down for communities to help them with planning related um, activities such as updating a plan, but also updating building codes and ordinances and writing them. So there is some funding opportunity coming down possibly at the end of this year, but most likely at the beginning of this that year. So if you watch the link, you'll get information on that. So right now um, I'm going to put up a um, poll, one of our one last poll, one more question, and then we're going to transition into our Q and A section. So let me launch the poll. And if you could just take a couple of uh, seconds, 30 seconds maybe to, to answer the question and then we'll get on over to that. Lots of great information and thank you so much to our panelists for presenting that. And at this time um, through the poll, I will ask everyone to turn on their video and unmute themselves as we go into that. And again, we're gonna leave the Q&A chat box up the whole time. So if you're shy or if you don't wanna put your name out there, you can ask questions anonymously. Um, at the end of this, we're going to re-put up everyone's contact information. So if you would like to contact everyone, we will have that for you. And Just a few more seconds. Thank you everyone for taking the time. Getting some, getting some answers. And uh, if you haven't noticed, I'm sure it's been popping up. Kate's been doing a great job of sharing um, resources, links, anything inside the chat that you can go to of all of our speakers, what they spoke about, we can we can answer that as well. So, all right, perfect. I'm gonna end the poll right now. And then I'm gonna change my view so we get to see all of us, I believe. Let's see. There we go. All right. Thank you everyone for joining. Just a few um, housekeeping things. Uh, we have disabled the chat box, um, but we will have that Q&A up. And uh, I'll also read questions. Uh, thank you to uh, Rebecca 
who led the charge in asking some questions throughout the webinar. Um, I'm going to reread some of those. I'm going to revisit that just in case anyone missed them. And uh, we have only about 12 minutes for question, um, which is good, lots of information. And I appreciate everyone for trying to compile that into as sh short as 20 minutes. Um, but again, there will be contact information up for everyone so that if you have follow-up questions, please, please reach out. So let me get on over here. So um, this question is for Jim and I know um, you sort of answered it. So I was wondering if we could dive a little bit more into it. How aware do you think local building code officials and communities are about FEMA public assistance reimbursement for building code and floodplain management enforcement and administration after federally declared disasters with FEMA, PA, permanent work designations? A lot of words there. But yeah, a lot of words and a short answer is not very many are aware. Um, I really think that that is, uh, and I've seen a lot of information on it. I've um, done some brief presentations on it, but I really don't think, well, I think overall, um, local building officials and local code officials are not aware of uh, what their duties are in, in response to a disaster anyway. And then on top of that, being able to find funding to get some of that stuff done, I think they're even less aware of that. Um, I, I really think that it's, it, I strongly um, am, am pushing on a national level uh, that local building officials be trained in post-disaster damage assessment and what happens. And to me, part of that is what kind of funding can you get? Yeah. Um, I mean, do you have any suggestions? I mean, I, I know forums like this are helpful to get that information out, but do you have any suggestions as far as how we can better educate people on that? I, I think you really, in Texas, you probably really need to kind of reach out to uh, like the Texas Municipal League uh, that can get uh, information out to those local communities. I know that uh, TDM does a good job with the emergency managers, uh, you know, and kind of getting that information out there. Uh, but you really need to kind of touch um, uh, your local elected officials and the city managers, things like that, so that that trickles down that trickle down works much better than somebody trying to push that, uh, that ball back up a hill. Um, you know, if a, a mayor or something comes down and says, hey, we really need to apply for this, it'll happen. Um, but if the local building official says, hey, I think we need to, and everybody's scrambling around after a disaster, it gets pushed aside. Mm -hmm. Yes, that makes sense. And, I, and you uh, mentioned that uh, building officials, I mean, need to be trained. And it, that's something that that boat offers, or is that something that um, they can seek out that information to get trained for damage assessment? Yes, both of those. Boat offers the training on a regular basis through our, our BPIs, and uh, we do take it on the road when we find you know an area that wants it. Like we're scheduled to come to South Texas and uh, put on a training for post disaster evaluators. Um, and you know that's all available, or you can seek it on a national level. Like I said, both Cal OES uh, and the ICC has a wind disaster strikes. Uh, both of those are FEMA kind of approved trainings and do keep that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And um, they can find it. And if possibly, if they have questions, they want to follow up with you. Is that all right? If they reach out to you? Or Absol absolutely. Or just get on the boat website. There's some of that on the boat website. But when you look at the number there, it's my number anyway. So you can just give me a call or email me. Yeah. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, and for uh, Brian, I know, uh, or I believe the ISTAT and PSTAT was that? No, that was Ken. That's Ken. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so I know you had covered this in uh, in your presentation, lots of wealth of knowledge, but can you just provide a, a brief, you know, overview of what is the, you know, major difference between ISTAT and PSTAT and when you should use each? Certainly. So uh, Jim uh, does a lot on the ISTAT side, uh, whereas the PSTAT, what I was uh, talking about, and that was a just-in-time training that we put together that's still valid as of the last 48 hours because we're still dealing with the winter storm. Uh, but the PSTAT is for the uh, government uh, proper, so uh, government facilities specifically, 
uh, roads, streets, uh, uh, drainage ditches, uh, infrastructure, water plants, uh, the big ticket items. Uh, the, uh, if you dialed in on that uh, QR code, you had an opportunity as you picked which event. Uh, we've made a lot of changes. Uh, the changes are constant, uh, but we try to make it uh, simplistic and intuitive. Uh, but uh, once you get into that, uh, the government officials, uh, you can use uh, ISTAT or PSTAT. You can do ISTAT for people. Uh, but our, we encourage uh, you to use professionals like uh, the boat teams that will come out and help with that piece of it. Uh, we have some other groups that we can deploy if necessary. So it's, it's apples and oranges. So uh, uh, individual structures, extremely important. It's a package uh, and we, ha we give you the uh, opportunity to uh, uh, collect that damage through that package. The PSTAT is very unique to uh, the federal requirements or the, the standards that we need for all the different agencies of the federal partners. Uh, to collect uh, damage for those big ticket items. So hopefully that answers that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, sometimes in those uh, in the webinar, it can get a little lost. So it's good to kind of reiterate some of those things. Um, and for Alex and Julie, I have a question because I um, took the training to, to be an evaluator. And I know that um, there's through the certain levels, you can do either retrofits and then I believe it's the gold level that you have to do a full rebuild, right? Do you want to talk a little bit about that, some of those differences? Yeah, sure thing. So um, as one of the easiest ways to achieve fortified um, is, is really when you're re-roofing if you have an existing home. Um, that is the most cost effective because you're going to be tearing, you should be tearing off the roof anyway. Two layers is not advised. Um, and so you can apply the standards at that time and engage an evaluator and, and a roofer that's certified. Um, the reason why we talk about gold being primarily a new construction application um, is because of all of the, is because of the load path and because we are documenting everything. So even if something is built to code and may have a load path, um, if it is not documented, we don't have photographs and it hasn't been viewed by an evaluator, then we, if we can't see it, then we, we don't, we can't just take somebody's word that it exists. So we do, we do like to have those photos uh, and we require that an engineer be involved in that. And I know that many places in Texas and the coastal areas, that is something that is already taking place because of some of the, the wind pool requirements. Um, however, in the inland areas, there's there's not a we don't see a lot of engineering, and that would be an, a requirement in, in some of the high wind regions. Um, silver could go either way. We we primarily see that with existing homes because if you're going to if you're in the coastal areas and you're going to get hurricane shutters um, or think something like that, then you can actually add that to your re-roof and your and your hurricane shutters, and and there may be some other things you have to do. But um, by and large, the two designations we see most is is roofing at the re-roofing phase and then the, the gold at the, at the new construction. I hope that makes some, helps clarify some things. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's helpful because I think uh, sometimes for that gold standard, people don't realize that those are, those are full rebuilds from the bottom yeah. up. So. Yeah. Um, it can be done if you're doing this, especially like we did see some interest in that after um, the flooding in Houston because people were gutting anyway. So they decided they wanted to go ahead and move forward. We actually had a nonprofit as, um, Team Rubicon did a gold project and they had an engineer come in and they were able to retrofit using the hurricane straps and the load path and, and that they did that successfully, but it is it is quite a bigger effort when you're doing it to an existing home. For sure, but certainly with Fortify, you know, a little bit more on that front end can really help on that back end and that recovery. You got it. Um, well, I know we're running out of time, so thank you so much um, for uh, Brian. I had a, a question, um, you talking about the damage assessments and um, getting the information in so that we can figure out different declarations and stuff. Um, is there a time frame? Like, is there a cutoff or time frame that people need to get that information in for damage assessments? This could be Brian or Ken, I believe, but um, Brian, yeah. Um. I, I'm having a bit of trouble hearing, so I'd like to confirm you can nod. Uh, you're asking about the, the damage assessments and then going forward, the part that FEMA seems to be most concerned with would be the substantial damage piece, I think. Is it? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I was just having a conversation with 
our uh, branch director about um, we just we're, we just did a lessons learned from the 2020 uh, season, and um, we're currently engaged in some program reviews with some communities around Texas. And I was explaining to him, you know, that if a community is 30 days in past the event and they haven't mobilized uh, teams to begin doing inspections on the structures that are near the, the threshold of substantial damage, which is 50% of market value, um, and this would be the step beyond the initial damage assessments that uh, Ken and Jim uh, referred to, um, then they're behind the curve. Uh, and we need to be in there providing technical assistance as needed to get them mobilized and to get that, that process going. Because really, it, the, the Disaster Reform, uh, uh, Recovery Reform Act 1206 piece, it, it, it all has to be done in 180 days. Um, that's the timeline. And um, if, if it's not done by then, if the community doesn't have that detailed damage information on the more heavily damaged structures, they're going to miss funding opportunities for mitigation. The information simply won't be available to develop the grant applications and be able to demonstrate that the uh, the, the return on investment is going to be there uh, for that grant application. So it's 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 vitally important that the community have a plan before the event uh, and know who's going to do what and when they're going to do it. Uh, and if you don't have that plan, I encourage you to reach out to your your um, Texas Water Development Board to help you develop that. Um, you can reach out to us at FEMA Region Six. Uh, there are three of us there, myself, Lauren Fulton, and Mike Segner. Um, and, and, you know, get some, get some help with that. It's vitally important that you have that plan in place ahead of time. That's, that's great. That's a great thing to end on. And again, in our part one, there is a lot of things we outline as far as what you can do beforehand. Um, I have so many more questions, but in respect of everyone's time, we're going to cut it off there. Again, I'm putting up um, a screen right now that has all of the contact information. Um, please reach out if you have any questions. We will be sending a follow-up email. Um, I'm going to include the questions that were asked but not an answered live and uh, in the recording for that. So we have future webinars coming up on um, topics of how to avoid fraud and the recovery phase. So I hope you tune in then, we'll keep you updated. And to all of uh, the panelists and the presenters, thank you so much for being here with us today. This was um, very informative and great information. Everybody stay safe. Thank you. Thank you everybody, it's a great meeting, very informative. Thanks for joining us.